You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Hello, and welcome to the show Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures, and I am your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Just a reminder that the views and opinions expressed on Words on Film are solely those of my own. Uh, your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and do not necessarily reflect those of the employees of the stations airing this broadcast or the network as a whole. With that being said, let's get into my first segment, which is What's Topping the Box Office? These are the top 10 highest grossing films of this past weekend. So, number one at the box office is actually the also the highest grossing debut movie of the week, and that is The Dark Tower. The Dark Tower, on a budget of $60 million, has, has grossed just $19.2 million this past weekend. Again, I'm going to hold my tongue and try not to let my personal opinion of this film, which I will be reviewing later in the show, get in the way of the statistics. But, so far, The Dark Tower has grossed $19.2 million here in the United States and $27.2 million around the world. So it's neither a hit here in the States or around the world, but it's off to a pretty good start, all things considered. Dunkirk, number two at the box office this weekend, sliding from number one for the first time in its third week run. This weekend, Dunkirk grossed $17.1 million. So overall, it was a relatively slow weekend, particularly for summer, but we're still here. And so far, Dunkirk has grossed in the United States $133.1 million total in its three weeks, and around the world it has grossed $314.2 million, which makes Dunkirk a tentative hit here in the United States, but around the world it is a certified hit. So very good for Dunkirk. I think that movie deserves it. The Emoji Movie was number two at the box office last week, and despite the really, really bad press this movie has been getting, it is number three at the box office this week. I don't know how that is, but that is just how it is. The Emoji Movie on a budget of $50 million, oh, by the way, it grossed $12 million this weekend, but on a budget of $50 million, the Emoji Movie has so far grossed $49.1 million here in the States, and 62.2 million around the world, which makes it not a hit yet here in the States, although very close to being a tentative hit. And all, <clears throat> excuse me, and already it is a tentative hit around the world. Girls Trip, in its third week in release, is number four at the box office, sliding from number three last week. Girls Trip is a movie that I think deserves a lot better than the Emoji movie, but because it's rated R, it didn't quite get the same kind of press that the Emoji movie did. Regardless, this weekend it made $11.4 million, just $0.6 million less than the Emoji Movie. Against a budget of $27.7 million, Girls Trip has so far grossed $85.4 million here in the States and $90.9 .9 million around the world, which makes it a certified hit here in the States and around the world despite having never been number one at the box office. That's a very impressive feat. Kidnap, starring Halle Berry, is number five at the box office this weekend in its debut. It's the second highest grossing debut movie of the week, having grossed $10 million this weekend against a budget of $20 million. I don't have any information about how it grossed internationally, but in the United States, it's grossed half its budget, which means it's not a hit yet, but it might be by next week. Spider-Man Homecoming is number six at the box office this weekend, sliding slightly from number five last week. Spider-Man Homecoming grossed $8.8 .8 million in its fifth weekend in release. Against a budget of $175 million, Spider-Man Homecoming has so far grossed $295 million here in the States and $671 million around the world. So Spider-Man Homecoming is a tentative hit here in the States. Around the world, it is a certified hit. And it will probably be a certified hit here in the States sometime in the next couple of weeks. Atomic Blonde is a movie that I am amazed is not doing better than it is, and I'm even more amazed that it's not doing better than the Emoji Movie. I won't rant about how bad the Emoji Movie was, but Atomic Blonde was a much, much better film, and it's really unfortunate that it's not doing as well, nearly as well as the Emoji Movie. But this weekend, Atomic Blonde slide, slid from number four 
last week to number seven this week, having made $8.2 million, less than half of what the Dark Tower made. So, so far, against a budget of $30 million, the Atomic Blonde has so far made $34 million here in the States and $45.8 million around the world, which makes it a tentative hit both here in the States and around the world. Detroit is the third highest grossing debut movie of the week, but it opened at number eight at the box office, which is really unfortunate. Again, I'm going to hold my tongue and try not to tell you what I thought about the movie, but I will tell you this. Detroit has grossed $7.1 million this past weekend, and against a budget of $34 million, it has so far grossed $7.6 million in the United States alone. I don't have any international numbers for you, but it's not even close to being a hit on such a modest budget. And that, again, biting my tongue, trying not to tell you what I thought about the movie, but moving on. Let's move on to number nine. This is another disappointment. War for the Planet of the Apes is number nine at the box office this weekend, sliding from number six last week. War for the Planet of the Apes in its fourth week in release only made $6.2 million. Against a budget of $150 million, War for the Planet of the Apes has so far made $130.4 million here in the States and $278.2 million around the world. So while it's not a hit yet here in the States, even though it was number one four weeks ago, War for the Planet of the Apes is a tentative hit around the world, so that's something, but I still think that War for the Planet of the Apes deserved a lot better. Despicable Me 3 is number 10 at the box office this weekend, having grossed $5.4 million and actually staying in the top 10 longer than Cars 3, which is undeserving and quite surprising. But Despicable Me against a budget of $80 million has grossed $240.9 million at the box office in the United States in its entire six-week run, and is actually the, I guess you could call it the oldest movie in the top 10 this week, and around the world it has grossed a staggering $881.6 million. That's more than Wonder Woman has made internationally, which is not in the top 10, by the way, and I don't quite get what the appeal of Despicable Me and the Minions is, and for all intents and purposes, the reviews for this movie has been um, pretty bad, but here in the States and around the world, it is a certified hit. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures, to which you are listening on bostonfreeradio.com, watching on Somerville Community Access Television or some community access TV station near you, or on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on the Boston Free Radio Facebook page. Either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. The first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is a movie that didn't debut especially well. It debuted at number eight at the box office. I thought it'd be a lot higher than that. But it's a movie that definitely deserves to be seen, and it is Detroit. The reason I picked this film first is I usually have a pattern of what movies I review in what order. I usually pick the one that is probably the most talked about movie. And considering that this, that Detroit debuted at number eight, I am actually surprised it debuted as low as it did. But I do think that word of mouth is going to spread, hopefully by me, (laughs) partially. And people are going to realize what a great movie this is because it is definitely a great movie. So Detroit is a movie not just about the city of Detroit, not about the history, but about a race riot that ensued during the summer of 1967. That is, it deb- it, it ensued over 50 years ago at this point. And it, a police raid in Detroit in 1967 results in a multi-day riot, and this story in particular, this movie, is centered on the Algiers Motel incident, which occurred in Detroit, Michigan on July 25th, 1967, during the racially charged 12th Street riot. It involves the death of three black men and the beatings of nine other people, seven black men and two white women, all of whom were guests at the Algiers Motel at the time. So you're introduced to a wide array of characters. You're introduced to one part-time security guard who is black. His name is Melvin Dismukes, 
who I'm not sure if he is somebody who existed in real life or is a composite character, but he's played very well in this movie with a very grounded performance by John Boyega, who you'll probably remember best from Star Wars Episode Seven: The Force Awakens from two years ago. And you'll undoubtedly see him in future Star Wars movies, including the Episode Eight that will be coming out this coming holiday season. So he is not at the Algiers Motel. He's actually alerted along with other members of the National Guard and uh, other riot police who are there when somebody shoots a starter pistol, jokingly, from the Algiers Motel. So the police and all other units are dispatched to the Algiers Motel, and what results is a controversial police interrogation headed by Cadet Philip Kraus of the Detroit City Police, who's played in a career-defining performance in this film by Will Poulter. And Will Poulter is an actor who you might remember from a number of films. I remember him best from a movie called We're the Millers, which came out uh, four or five years ago. It was a movie that starred Jason Sudeikis, Jennifer Aniston, and Emma Roberts. And actually, Will Poulter was really funny in that movie. I remember he was probably the breakout star of this film, but it is astonishing to me that when I saw him in this movie, I completely forgot about his performance in We're the Millers. And Will Poulter is an actor who has a very young-looking face. And when you see him in this movie, you notice the very young-looking face, but he has a, t has a very intense performance in this film that almost offsets how young and how innocent he, look. Ba and he looks. And basically, he plays a racist cop who you hate almost immediately when his character is introduced. He is introduced in this film during the riots, and he... His character actually shoots a black man in the back who's carrying groceries, assuming that this black man stole the groceries. So from there, it, it just goes downhill from there with his character. But I do have to say that I hated Will Poulter so much in this movie. And that's not saying that he did a bad job. He did a great job, but... You will hate his character so much that you will think he probably doesn't deserve an Oscar nomination because of how awful his character is. But that's precisely why he should be nominated. Another character or another actor that should be nominated for this movie is a lesser known actor by the name of Algie Smith, who plays an aspiring singer in the Detroit area. And remember, this is 1967. So this is when A, Motown was still in Detroit and B, when Motown was at its most popular. But he plays a character named Larry Reed, who, like Philip Krause, actually existed and was involved in the Algiers Motel incident. And he is an aspiring singer with... Siren going by. Hold on. I will cut that out of my rebroadcast, but as I was saying... Larry Reed was an aspiring singer who was part of the group The Dramatics, and they were just about to make their big break at a Detroit theater when the riots broke out and everybody had to go home. So there's a lot to say about the, the movie Detroit. I don't have enough time to get into this movie and what makes it so great, but it is directed by Catherine Bigelow, which you wouldn't have expected given that the cast is largely African-American and largely male, but that doesn't really matter at this point. This is probably the most blaring account of police brutality I have probably ever seen in a mainstream movie. And Catherine Bigelow, you might know from having directed other films such as Zero Dark Thirty and The Hurt Locker. The Hurt Locker is the movie for which she was the first female to win Best Director, and The Hurt Locker also won Best Picture. Detroit is better than The Hurt Locker, as hard as that is to believe. And I'll tell you something else, too. Watching this film, it made me angry, it made me sad, and it made me sick. But... Detroit is the best movie I've seen 
in 2017 so far, and it gets my rating of a knockout. It's so good, in fact, that A, other movies that have come out, particularly this summer, seem cornball compared to Detroit, and B, it's just... It, it's... It's just... I, It's just a movie that is definitely worth seeing. The spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And as I wait for that siren to go by, this is a, isn't a completely soundproof studio, so I just do the best I can. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing is The Dark Tower. This is the long-awaited movie adaptation of the of part of the book series written by Stephen King. It's brought to us from Akiva Goldsman, Jeff Pinkner, and Anders Thomas Jensen, as well as the director, Nikolai Arcel, based on the novels, as previously noted, by Stephen King. So the movie, for those of you who are not familiar with the story or with the books, are th this movie is about... The last gunslinger, Roland Deschane, who's played by Idris Elba, who has been locked in an eternal battle with Walter O'Dim, also known as the Man in Black, who's played here very well by Matthew McConaughey. And the Man in Black is determined to prevent Roland Deschane from toppling the Dark Tower, which holds the universe together. With the fates of the worlds at stake, good and evil will collide in the ultimate battle as only Roland can defend the tower from the man in black. So as you can imagine, the Dark Tower is a very complicated story, and in the center of this story is actually a young kid by the name of Jake Chambers, who's played by Tom Taylor. And Jake Chambers has... These dreams, which he are, which he is convinced are not dreams, even though his parents and his psychologist tell him that they simply are. And of course, his dreams are about the gunslinger, the man in black, and the dark tower, which is this tower that holds the universe together. So once the these dreams of Jake Chambers are introduced, you're given some good backstory behind the gunslinger Roland Deschain, who's played very well here by Idris Elba, and the conflict he has with the man in black, Matthew McConaughey's character. But the, ex the explanation and the exposition behind the Dark Tower was not very well executed in this movie, and I think the release of this exposition in the film made the first part of the film, or at least the first act, <clears throat> very draggy. In fact, I have to confess that I fell asleep during the first part of the movie, especially when it came when it got into Jake Chambers trying to get together um, materials for a time portal and trying to find out certain where where certain time portals were located. I personally, for somebody who'd never read the book, was completely confused. And also, I wouldn't have assumed that the Dark Tower, something called the Dark Tower, and something that looks even darker than anything in the Lord of the Rings, would be a source of good. It also doesn't make sense to me that the Man in Black would try to destroy the Dark Tower, because you would think that the tower being dark and the man being dressed in black, would the, the, the two would... I guess be one and the same, but apparently that's not the case. And I think that piece of confusion is one of the reasons I can't quite strongly recommend The Dark Tower as much as I would like. I did think the actor who played <clears throat> Jake Chambers, Tom Taylor, did a pretty good job. I, I actually really liked Matthew McConaughey as the bad guy in this film. You you see Matthew McConaughey, but he uses a voice that's not his usual Texas drawl, his usual, all right, all right, all right. You don't hear any of that with Matthew McConaughey, and I actually thought that was an asset to his performance. Also, Matthew McConaughey is not someone who's played a villain before. In fact, I think this film is his very first 
villainous role. And it's good. And as a matter of fact, Matthew McConaughey is not somebody who is particularly scary, but there are se- there are scenes where he walks up to people, just puts his hand over their mouth and says, stop breathing. And sure enough, those people stop breathing and ultimately die. That's pretty scary, especially when somebody who's not scary in appearance does something really scary like that. That is actually quite terrifying. And just to let you know, Dark The Dark Tower is not completely a horror movie. It's been primarily described as an action adventure fantasy, which I, I think it falls into pretty well. I but again, Idris Elba did a great job here as the gunslinger. I thought he had some great action sequences with his gun, and also he had a very good mantra here about what it took to be a really great gunslinger, which he passes on to the young Jake Chambers. I thought that was all in good. And I loved the showdown between the the gunslinger and the man in black. I thought that was pretty well executed. Again, the second and third act of this movie... I didn't have very much of a problem with. I did think the alternate universe looked kind of dull and dreary, but that's another problem I had with The Dark Tower. But I've heard people who have read the book complain basically about the same thing I did. It took on a lot of complicated material, and the exposition for it was pretty weak. And they also noted that The Dark Tower, especially given the number of books it took to, well, get them the series going probably should have been best adapted into a mini series either for HBO, Netflix, Hulu, what have you. And I I have to agree there. I, of course, this is the golden age of of television right now or the second golden age where there are some really high quality shows shown not only on TV but also on streaming. And I don't think that The Dark Tower worked as well as a one hour and 35 minute movie as much as it probably would a in a two or three hour movie i would have you know been able to sit there for three hours if the movie was good or b a mini series which i think would have been more appropriate for it however i do think that the uh, performances by many of those involved in this movie especially by matthew mcconaughey and idris elba make up a little bit for the draggy story and the clunky exposition but the dark tower gets my rating of a checkout because i do think that there are some strengths that i think overshadow a lot of the weaknesses but i do think that the critics and the dark tower fans are right in that the dark tower should have been longer and or it should have been a mini series welcome back to words on film on boston free radio i'm your host and movie critic dan burke words on film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures the next movie i'm going to be reviewing for you is kidnap this is the latest starring halle berry and it is about a kidnapping specifically the kidnapping of Halle Berry's son in this film. And the tagline is, a mother stops at nothing to recover her kidnapped son. So a tagline like that, or at least a brief plot explanation like that, made led me to believe that this movie was going to be like Taken with Liam Neeson, where somebody who's had special ops training and hand-to-hand combat training would go after their missing kid. Well, it's not exactly like that. Halle Berry in this movie plays a woman by the name of Carla, who is just a waitress at a diner. She is involved in a divorce settlement with her husband uh, over the custody of her son, Frankie, who's played in this movie by Sage Coria. And I gotta tell you, the very beginning of this movie, even though you know this kid Frankie's going to be kidnapped, shows a lot of home movies which were probably not made specifically for the film. They probably were real home movies of the actor Sage Coria. But my God, this kid is adorable. (laughs) So once the opening credits open and you see that the film's going to be called Kidnap, you you automatically begin to think, oh no, this kid's going to be kidnapped. But... By whom? That's the question. Well, it all starts when Carla takes her son Frankie to the park for the day, and she's on a phone call with her husband's lawyer regarding custody and also other 
alimony type issues. And then, lo and behold, Frankie goes missing. And Halle Berry's character experiences probably one a mother's or a parent's greatest nightmare that her son didn't just wander off, that somebody actually kidnapped him. And sure enough, Halle Berry's character sees her son be dragged off by a mysterious woman in a in a Chevy, and Carla gets into her, her into her minivan and chases the kidnappers way down the highway in Louisiana. As a matter of fact, this film was actually filmed on location in New Orleans, and you, you won't see a lot of the downtown. French Quarter, New Orleans places here. You, you'll mostly find a lot of the highways, but the chase that goes on between Halle Berry's character and the people who kidnapped her son are indeed very thrilling. I do have to say that the beginning of the movie made me doubt that this kid would have been kidnapped as easily Especially, I, I don't think that Halle Berry's character in this film would have taken her eye off her kid as easily as she did in this movie. In fact, maybe it was the name of the movie that, that threw me off, but as I was watching Halle Berry on her phone taking care of other business, I began to think, you should probably turn around and look at your son. I, I, I guess that... That would seem to be an automatic reaction for me. But then again, I don't have any children. I haven't taken any children to the park to keep an eye on them to make sure they're safe. So I don't exactly know if this kind of thing would be realistic. I also don't know if Halle Berry's reaction in this film to her son being kidnapped was realistic either. When I saw her especially getting behind the wheel and trying to get her son back from these kidnappers in this other car, I thought maybe her panicking was an underreaction. But then again, when you're trying to get your son back, you are indeed emotional, but you also have to be capable of rational thought, I would imagine. I, did, I do have to say, however, that in this age of cell phones, the way that Halle Berry's character lost her cell phone seems entirely plausible to me. But as I said, very much like The Dark Tower, Kidnap is a movie that starts off questionable, but not with confusing exposition at all. As a matter of fact, I found myself rooting for Halle Berry as this chase was going on. And an another factor is that the second and third act of this movie when Halle Berry comes face to face with these kidnappers is truly worth the wait throughout the first part of this movie. So I do have to say that the, the kidnapping itself seemed a little contrived. And I also doubted the motives of the kidnappers themselves, especially since they went to a park full of children, why they chose one child Halle Berry's character's child in this film over others. I don't know, but it's one of those things you just have to go along with. But I do have to say that even though Detroit was the best movie I saw this week, Kidnap was a movie that was good for what it was. You have a struggling single mother who goes after her child by any means necessary. She doesn't have access to a cell phone, and that's not contrived at all. She also doesn't have any background in hand-to-hand -hand combat or special ops training that you're used to a character like Liam Neeson's character having in the Taken films. There's nothing like that. And I respect the movie for being... A, and not only do I respect it, I applaud it for showing somebody who doesn't have that experience going against the odds and fighting her kidnappers to the finish to get her child back. And the third act of this movie where she actually goes to the the kidnapper's dwelling where her child might be is very thrilling. So there was a lot to like about Kidnap. I thought Halle Berry did a, a good job in this film acting. I don't know if this movie is going to be her comeback, but I do have to say that she certainly acts well in it. 
again, I, I can't verify how realistic her her reaction to her child being kidnapped is, particularly when she gets behind the wheel, but it had me enthralled, and I love the, the chase that ensued with this movie. So Kidnap is not the same movie as Taken, and I'm glad it's not the same movie as Taken. As a matter of fact, I do think the movie Taken is overrated. I had a better time watching Kidnap, and it gets my rating of a marginal, but still a knockout. Again, it's a terrifying situation where somebody of ordinary means takes on extraordinary circumstances, and I think that's what people are going to get. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Landline. This is the latest from director Jillian Robespierre. That was a somewhat of a difficult last name. And Jillian Rose-Pierre is also the director of the movie Obvious Child, which came out in theaters three years ago and starred Jenny Slate. And lo and behold, the star of Landline is indeed Jenny Slate. But Jenny Slate co-stars in this movie with Edie Falco, John Turturro, and another lesser-known actress who plays her sister, whose name is Abby Quinn, who I think... She plays a a teen in this movie, but she might be in her early 20s in real life. Abby Quinn has not been in many movies so far. She's been in one episode of Law & Order SVU, and she starred in other movies such as The Journey is the Destination and The Sisterhood of Night, which you, I'm guessing, and no disrespect to these movies or their movie makers, you probably haven't seen. But either way, I think... She and Jenny Slate actually come off very well as as sisters in this film. Not only do they look a lot alike, but their interactions are quite genuine. But before I get into the acting, let me tell you what the story's about. So this movie takes place in 1995, and the reason it's called Landline is because those are the only phones we had back then. Now, I mean, landlines are still around, but they're somewhat obsolete, especially in this day of cell phones. But in 1995, there were cell phones. The cell phone had been invented in the early 80s, but they were notoriously expensive. In fact, more people had pagers than they had cell phones. But anyway, in 1995, a teenager living with her sister and parents in Manhattan discovers that her father is having an affair. So, the father in this movie is John Turturro, and at first it seems like he gets along really well with his wife, Pat, who's played by Edie Falco, best known for playing Carmela Soprano in The Sopranos. But then, Allie, who again is played by Abby Quinn, who's a teenager who's still living with her parents, goes onto her Macintosh computer... Remember those? I, I'm talking about the LC2 and the Macintosh Performa, the ones that were in the early 90s. I remember those computers. Those were all we had. I mean, now technology's gotten a lot more advanced. But anyway, she gets on her computer and discovers that her father had written love letters to another person who's described as just the letter C. So... John Turturro's character doesn't do a great job concealing these letters, but it's pretty clear from these letters, possibly, that he's having an affair. At the same time, Dana, Allie's older sister, who's played by Jenny Slate, is engaged to a young man named Ben, who's played by J. Duplass. But at the same time, she is having an affair with a man by the name of Nate, who's played by Finn Whitrock, who is an incredibly good-looking guy. So while Ali's older sister is having an affair, her father's having an affair. So it's a very dicey kind of uh, family dynamic going on here. But both sisters ultimately have to deal with their father's alleged infidelity. And you're really not sure, as the movie's going on, whether or not the father's engaging in an extramarital affair but you're kind of wrapped into the 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 mystery with these two sisters and it's also of note that Dana's or Jenny Slate's character's age is not revealed in this movie but Jenny Slate as of August 8th 2017 is 35 years old but at the same time Jenny Slate with her youthful appearance and also her 
relatively high-pitched voice could probably pass for 17 or 18. So it is established that she's been through college and she's now living and working on her own outside of her her parents' home. But it's not quite clear exactly what age she is. I don't think she's supposed to be 35 in this movie because eventually she stays home temporarily with her parents and begins to get into a natural state of arrested development by staying in the same room as her sister and also, you know, not go, taking a, a few too many sick days from work, staying home, listening to her CD player, because remember, this is 1995. But I didn't quite... I, it would have been clearer to know why Jenny Slate's character was so reluctant to grow up because it's understandable why she would have this feeling of uncertainty with her current fiance, which is part of the reason why she's having the affair. But I don't get why she wants to revert to her childhood or teenage ways. And it wasn't really made clear in this film. And ultimately, the movie kind of forgets the differences between 1995 and the year we live in right now, 2017. And at first, the the movie being called Landline, you would think that it would be more focused on the technological differences between then and now. And for a while it was, but ultimately it forgot that. And I do understand that the movie couldn't quite be a a throwback movie, a movie that just reeks nost- or waxes nostalgia. I get that, but at the same time, the landline phone doesn't really play a significant part in this film or the lack of communication. And I, I would think that it would play a more prominent role. In addition to that, I thought the conflicts in this film got resolved a little too well at the end. However, I do think that the four people in this movie family, Jenny Slate, E.D. Falco, John Turturro, and Abby Quinn, worked together very well as a family unit. I thought they had great chemistry. And I give this movie a checkout because it's not altogether a great movie. I certainly liked Obvious Child a lot better because it told a different story about someone who was getting pregnant. And it, it was a little bit more laissez-faire about the abortion process as other movies. It was a bold move to make for Obvious Child to be a movie like that, but I think it resulted in a better movie that took a lot more risks. And I feel like Landline should have been riskier, but instead, I don't think a lot of people are going to be talking about this movie weeks from now. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures, to which you are listening on bostonfreeradio.com, watching on Community TV, or watching on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's page. Either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. The last movie I'm going to be reviewing for you for this show is one called Some Freaks, which just came out this past Friday. And it's one of those films that I had never heard of before I saw it playing at a nearby movie theater. But once I saw it, I'm really actually glad I did. It is a unique movie that when you watch it, you will be reminded about how painful and how cruel high school can be. It's a movie about a charming romance that develops between a boy with one eye and an overweight girl, though when she loses her weight after going to college, their relationship is tested in devastating ways they never dreamed would happen. That is the plot summary of the film. Does it spoil the movie? I actually don't think so. But there's a lot going on here, a lot of very interesting characters. And this marks the directing and writing debut of Ian McAllister McDonald. And judging from this film, he's got a very bright future ahead of him. This is a movie that turns in first-rate performances by Thomas Mann, who plays Matt, the boy with one eye, and Lily Mae Harrington, who plays Jill, the overweight girl who... Matt, who is also a social misfit like Jill, begins to date. And I actually thought that 
Lily Mae Harrington, who plays Jill, did a fantastic job in the movie. She's a mo- she's a woman who is very um, well. She's not thin, but she has a dynamic personality that I think made me practically. I wouldn't say fall in love with her, but in high school, I think I definitely would have hung out with her and <laughs> we would have had a good time. So I, I, the dynamic that plays out between Matt and Jill is really good. I think they have excellent chemistry together. And I have to say something about Thomas Mann, too. Thomas Mann is an actor who I've seen in a number of films. He was in this year earlier this year he was in kong skull island which was okay two years ago he was in a film called me and earl and the dying girl and he played the part of me or at at, I, i guess more specifically he played a character by the name of greg and greg was also a social outcast in high school but probably more because of his own doing and with me and Earl and the Dying Girl, I love the actors who played Earl and the Dying Girl. I wasn't crazy about the character Greg. And I thought initially it might have been Thomas Mann's performance, but I don't think there was a lot of very good exposition regarding how Greg regarded himself as an outcast. I didn't re- think there was very much of an explanation behind why he considered Earl a co-worker and not his friend. And especially watching the film, I thought to myself, man, I would have killed to have known someone as cool as Earl when I was in high school. But the difference between me and Earl and the Dying Girl and this movie, Some Freaks, is that Thomas Mann's character, you can understand why he's a social outcast. And you can also understand why... You also get a good sense of the pain he goes through in high school, especially considering that the very first scene shows another kid hesitatingly taking off uh, uh, Thomas Mann's character's eye patch when Thomas Mann's character, Matt, is facing the other way. And then the next scene shows Thomas Mann covering his the, the eye that was covered from his eye patch with his hand, trying to retrieve the eye patch from these bullies and it's really not funny what these these other kids put matt through but it is all too real i didn't know anybody who was missing an eye when when i was in high school but i knew a lot of misfits and social outcasts i certainly had people making fun of me in high school for various things if you can believe it being on the radio a lot of people made fun of my voice in high school yeah Uh, So a lot of these bad feelings from high school came right back. But the, the love story between Jill and Matt was actually a really genuine one. And in the halfway point of this movie, Jill finds herself moving from Philadelphia to California to go to college, whereas Matt doesn't have a post high school plan and there's one scene where matt is fervently packing his bags to go to california with jill and it's a romantic notion at first but then his older sister uh georgia with whom he's living who's played by a beautiful young actress by the name of Marin ireland just noting that gives him sort of a realistic rundown of what he would have to endure if he moved to California from the East Coast. I think he lives in Philadelphia. But his sister is saying, you know, you don't have a place to live. You don't have a job. It's going to be hard to get it. It's not going to be easy to get a job, especially with just a high school diploma. You're going to miss your graduation. These are all valid concerns, but you can certainly understand the frustration of Matt when when all this comes to a realistic light for him. So I began to feel his pain as well. And there, when he reunites with Jill after six months of her being in college, and then he sees her with the significant weight loss, again, she doesn't look completely thin, but she's certainly trimmed down from what she was in high school. You can certainly understand that there's that quality of her not being as much of a misfit anymore. But I did like the other scenes showing her perspective in college where as much as she tried, 
she was still a misfit and still considered the fat girl. And there are a lot of great characters in this movie. There's another character who's Jill's cousin from Philly, whose name is Elmo Moss. That's his character's name, and he's played by Eli Henry, who reminded me a lot, actually, of Jonah Hill, and in a good way, because I'm not the biggest fan of Jonah Hill. But Some Freaks is a movie that will appeal to anyone who was or is a high school student, and it gets my rating of a knockout. It would have been the best film I'd seen this week had it not been for Detroit. But if you want to check it out, you can get it for six ninety nine on so, Amazon. I'm- Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. Now that I reviewed my five movies for the week, it's now time to get into my next segment, which is what's coming out next. These are the high-profile films and some indie films that are coming out this coming weekend, being the weekend of August 11th. So the biggest movie to come out this week, I think, or at least prob- what's probably going to be in the top five next week, depending, is the movie Annabelle Creation, which is actually the sequel to the horror film Annabelle about the possessed doll, and which was in turn a spinoff of The Conjuring. Now, those of you who might remember my worst of 2014 list, I I don't know how many of you do. I was just on the radio then. I wasn't on Facebook Live. But I listed Annabelle as one of the worst movies of 2014. However, it made enough movie to merit a sequel, and I know that The Conjuring has a pretty good following. But this is a movie about a doll maker and his wife who several years after the tragic death of their little girl welcome a nun and several girls from a shuttered orphanage into their home soon becoming the target of the doll maker's possessed creation annabelle so annabelle creation is not so much a sequel to 2014's annabelle as much as it is a prequel so I I have a rule with sequels that I don't go to see them unless I've seen the original one first. I have not seen The Conjuring, but I've seen Annabelle, and I will see Annabelle Creation. I won't be happy about it, but I will see it, and I'll let you know what I think next week. Another film that's coming out this coming weekend is The Glass Castle, and this is a movie that's based on the best-selling memoir, which was written by... <clears throat> if you'll just give me a second to look it up, Jeanette Walls, who is a gossip columnist. And apparently, Jeanette Walls had a very cataclysmic upbringing. The Glass Castle tells the story about a young girl who comes of age in a dysfunctional family of nonconformist nomads with a mother who's an eccentric artist and an alcoholic father who would stir the children's imaginations with hope as a distraction to their poverty. The movie stars Brie Larson, Woody Harrelson, Naomi Watts, and Ella Anderson and looks to be an Oscar contender so far. This is a movie where I wish I had actually read the book. I I will go to see it, but maybe I'll pick up the book first. I definitely recommend probably reading the book before seeing the movie. It's it's always a good idea. I think I might have gotten parts of The Dark Tower before I read the book. But regardless, The Glass Castle is a movie I probably will see by next week. And when I see it, I will let you know exactly what I think. Another movie that's coming out this weekend is another sequel, which I will not see. But I'll tell you about it just in case you want to see it. Again, when I bring up these movies, I'm just basing my my opinion about how they will be on mere speculation. I'm not saying whether these movies are good or bad. And I'm also not saying whether or not you should see these movies. This is just a preview of what's coming out next. So anyway, the sequel that's coming out is The Nut Job 2, Nutty by Nature. Already a bad pun in the title, but... Just to let you know, following the events of the first film, which I have not seen, Surly, the squirrel, and his friends must stop Oaktown City's, Oakton City's mayor from destroying their home to make way for a dysfunctional amusement park. The movie features the voice talents of Will Arnett, Katherine Heigl, Maya Rudolph, and Jackie Chan. I mean, some good high-profile voices there. But this is a movie I'm not going to see. But again, I'm not stopping you from seeing it. If you've seen the first Nut Job and you think you might enjoy the Nut Job 2, by all means, see it. 
But another film that I think I'm going to check out is one called Ingrid Goes West. This is a movie about a un, uh, about an unhinged social media stalker who moves to L.A. and insinuates herself into the life of an Instagram star. The movie stars Aubrey Plaza, Elizabeth Olsen, and from Straight Outta Compton, O'Shea Jackson Jr. O'Shea Jackson Jr. is, by the way, not only the actor who played Ice Cube in Straight Outta Compton, he also is Ice Cube's real-life son. So, it's good to see him in another movie besides playing his dad. And he was great in Straight Outta Compton. I thought he was one of the best actors in the film. But this is a movie that looks quirky. It looks relevant. And <laughs> Aubrey Plaza playing a stalker. I don't know. That sounds incredibly interesting. So if that movie's playing in a theater near me, I'll check it out. And I'll let you know exactly what I think on next week's show. And I believe that's about all the time I have for words on film for this week just another reminder that the word uh, that the show words on film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures and the views and opinions expressed on this show are solely those of your host and movie critic dan burke and did not necessarily did not necessarily reflect those of the employees of the stations airing this broadcast or the network as a whole so hope you tune in next week to for to see me to review movies and until then i'm dan burke your host and movie critic saying i'll see you at the movies